the next person we're going to share with you that I'm so grateful to have. And I'm just grateful that he'd be willing to take his time because I love to bring true entrepreneurs, not people that are born in the lucky sperm club, people who start with nothing and had a vision and fought through every obstacle to make it happen. And then everybody sees them now and sees them as an overnight success. But John is the founder and CEO of Peloton, ladies and gentlemen. Give it up for John Foley before you meet him in a moment. And what I love about him is here's a guy with super humble roots. You know, his dad was a pilot, his mom was a homemaker down here in Florida. And he didn't have somebody sending him to college. I see kids today sometimes and I, I think no one was gonna send me to college. I mean, you gotta work for it. He worked half time. So he'd go to school half time, work half time, pay for it. And he's somebody who, you know, he had some great CEO corporate jobs, but something inside him said, I want to do this on my own. I have a vision I want to make happen. I want to change this experience of fitness in people's homes. And he got four, over 400 no's from VCs. After being in the technology business, I'm sure some part of him, we'll find out, must have thought this is going to be easier than it was. But you've heard me share all the stories of people over the years. You know, the, the ones that have made it, almost always have seen 300, 400, 1,000 no's before they got the first yes. And then all of a sudden, they're this overnight success. And we all talk about here about really being successful in winter time. If you can do well in winter, you can do well in every season, financial season. And this little company called Peloton has grown geometrically in winter. Like, it's not just a winter company, but holy cow, they've had quarters where they've done over 200% more than the previous quarter. The company today is, I think they said it's projected to do four billion in sales by the end of the year, it was 1.7 last year. They're valued at $32.4 billion. They've had a million people train in a single day. They've had 23,000 people go to one class and they got 3.6 million members around the world. So let me introduce you to this amazing soul, John Foley. John, it's really a pleasure to have you here and a privilege to have you, thanks for joining us. Super fun to be here, Tony, and and the inspiration is coming from your community. It's uh, it's incredible. I was I was on for the last half hour. It's so fun to see you and see the faces and the energy of all the people. So thank you for tuning in. Well, our pleasure. And listen, you've built in one of the most amazing communities in the world. So, but I'd like to start with your roots, if I may, because you know big dreams start with people who have those dreams but won't let them anything stop them. And you come from some very humble roots. I read. I don't know if it's true that. You know, I put you through, through, through college, but you were also working like at a Skittles factory. Will you tell us a little bit about your history, your background, and did that, how did that inform your vision of business and life and what it takes to succeed? Yeah, uh, like you, Tony, I'm, I'm not uh, a young entrepreneur anymore. <laughs> so I'm in the <laughs> 70s, 70s and 80s when you went to work uh, to pay the bills. And my dad, to your point, was an airline pilot for Delta. He worked at the same company for 35 years after graduating the Naval Academy and fighting in the war. And so in the mid 80s, when I was thinking about college and so few people in the Florida Keys uh, went to college. So I was one of four or five people who out of 100 who went to college in my high school. Um, and he did wanted me to go to college, uh, but it was all about, um, I went to Georgia Tech, which is called the North Avenue Trade School. It's going to college so that you can get a job. It was very, you know, uh, uh, hand to mouth colleges to educate you to get a, a job. And so engineering at Georgia Tech had a, um, there's a co-op program where I did go to Waco, Texas six months a year. And I uh, eventually was responsible for Skittles and Starburst manufacturing uh, for North America. But it was great experience, industrial engineering. And you're right, I was able to pay my way through college. And, uh, you know, it's a twofer. You get a lot of money in college, you get to pay, you have a little change in your pocket vis-a-vis -vis other college kids, which generally didn't. And then you also graduate with two and a half years of incredible engineering work experience. So it was good. Uh, I mean, it wasn't as quite as fun as another college experience, but it was certainly uh, com commercial and, and fruitful. Well, it sets you up for success later on in life, having to push through that. How important is hunger for someone to be able to convert their dream into reality? Uh, and, as you deal with so many people, and now you know you got some CEO experience, tell us a little about your view of what it takes to be successful in business because uh, you certainly built it in many businesses, but now this one being obviously the crown jewels thus far. Well, it's funny in, in your intro, and I, I don't know whether I'm a humble guy or not, but you, you certainly said I was, so I'll own it for a second. But uh, uh, hunger and humility are two words that you, you've brought up in, in our short conversation, and they're, and they're two of the most important things that we look for at Peloton employees. Is And that hunger, I, I find that state school kids 
do better than Ivy League kids because they're hungrier and they've, they want to prove themselves. And oftentimes immigrants will be yes. wanting to prove something as well. And so when you look, when you think about that hunger, it's absolutely so important. I think it's more important than, you know, just raw intelligence. Um, cause there's a lot of smart people that kind of go sideways in life. But if you have that hunger and that drive and you're going to wake up on Monday morning and, um, a buddy of mine, Rob Bernstein, who runs a company called Coupa used to say, I want to hire people that want to tear down walls with their face. And it's like, wow, that. That, that, that's, that's ambition. I love that. How, uh, you know, in your history, who inspired you? Like, uh, you don't come from, you know, roots that would say you go run a $32 billion company. Did you have any business leaders or any individuals that were really an inspiration or role models for you early on? How'd they impact you? Yeah. So, uh, when I was, uh, an engineer in Atlanta and then, and then, uh, um, uh, eventually a shift manager in Waco, Texas as the manufacturing plant. My dad would always say, you know, you got to keep that job. It pays well. And, and he pictured me there for the next 30 or 40 years. Uh, but then I met a guy named John Pleasance who uh, interestingly was dating my sister, eventually married my sister. And he had gone to a fancy uh, private school. He went to an Ivy league, um, undergrad and then an Ivy league business school. And he was so fancy and he saw the world through a different lens of, of ambition and entrepreneurship. And he eventually, interestingly, Tony, to your uh, Bill Gross story, um, he eventually went over to a company called City Search in 1996 yes. in Los Angeles, which was part of the Bill Gross That's empire right. at the time yes. that, that I, eventually, I eventually joined that. So I, I'm part of the Bill Gross diaspora and, wow. uh, and uh, got to benefit from his vision back then. That's pretty amazing. That's wonderful. Yeah. You know, I, I always talk about proximity as power, that if you do, get in proximity with people with a different way of living life, a different standard of life, things can rub off on you and opportunities rub off on you. Tell me, um, you know, you were the CEO of barnesandnoble.com, if I understand correctly, and you were responsible right. bringing the Nook forward. And I know you were competing with some people that were ahead of the schedule for you at Amazon, and it didn't really succeed. Most people have an experience like that, especially in a corporate job. They probably kind of hang on to it, but it seemed to stimulate your hunger to do what you really wanted to do instead. Can you tell me how did that shape you, if at all? Yeah, it definitely shaped me, Tony. Uh, it's a good observation. Uh, digital media disrupted several massive categories. You think about gaming, when yeah. in the 80s you went to the arcade for gaming. Uh, music has been disrupted. There's no more CD stores, books, um, movies. And as we were, as we, I was at Barnes and Noble and actually my colleague, William Lynch and, and Jamie Anoni were largely responsible for the, for the innovation on the Nook platform. But, uh, I was certainly, certainly close enough to it to see, you know, digital media, if you can have a device in your hand and consume the content from home, instead of going to a bookstore, it's, it, and there's bigger selection and the prices are better. Um, it was, it was a better consumer experience and it was obviously the future. I looked at the same thing in a, in a fitness class and I said, wow, you could digitize this and build the similar hardware and software platform for consuming digital media in the fitness category. So yeah, I was absolutely piecing together the macro digital disruption and what industries would make sense. And, uh, and luckily I was, I was early on, on the fitness uh, vector. Well, you, you, you'd see those insights. A lot of people would see those insights, but not act on them. What made you act on them? I mean, was there an aha moment for you where you went from, well, wow, this is really interesting. This could be a possibility to this is my future. Well, I was a little, uh, I would say arrogant. I wasn't arrogant, but I was, I was bullish on myself that I could raise money and still afford my New York city lifestyle because people, it was such a good idea. And I was such a proven guy in, in my mind's eye, I was 40 years old and I'd been in technology for 15 years and I'd been running companies and it felt like such a perfect person to bet on. And the idea for Peloton for me felt like such an obvious future of fitness and such a big company in the making. But, they so did, but said, the, well, guy, the VCs over. didn't respond to you, right? You got, is it correct what uh, I saw? I, I saw somewhere you had 400 no's before you got your first yes. Is that true? That's exactly right. Well, that, uh, Tony, it's 400 institutions. You're absolutely right. Oh but there was gosh. thousands of angel, of angel investors too. I pitched thousands of angel investors to get a hundred angel checks for my first $10 million. But wow. when I, when I pushed off of Barnes and Noble and I said, I'm going to go off my own and start this company, the idea was to overcapitalize it so that I could pay myself a handsome salary and keep my kids in private school and keep the party going. But it was a rude awakening that four years later, I still hadn't taken any money out of the company and I was in mass in debt and on bended knee, and it, was, it wasn't quite the trajectory that I had planned. <laughs> 
What can, well, two things. Did you, I read someplace you had a, did you have angel investors first and then did a Kickstarter? Or did you do them at the same time? And then the follow up to that question is what kept you going? Because most people, you know, uh, somebody like, uh, you know, uh, Colonel Sanders goes and gets a thousand and nine no's. You probably know the story. Or Disney, 302 banks, you know, told him no. There's only guys like that nature, the names you know are the ones that do that. What gave you the capacity to keep going when you were, you know, your vision of what you thought would happen wasn't even close to true, meaning people weren't jumping all over you because you had this great background. What kept you going? And did you start with the Kickstarter or start with angels or both? Yeah, yeah, we did. We did angels and then we did a series A. And then I think we were in the middle of the series B when we launched the Kickstarter. And the Kickstarter was just kind of a four minute uh, commercial or video that we put together to tell the story. And we thought that as soon as people heard about Peloton, they would want one and throw money at us also flawed. The Kickstarter campaign was effectively a failure. Um, I think we sold 188 bikes and I knew a hundred of the people. Most of them were angel <laughs> investors. So it was, it was, it was no, there was nothing there. But oh uh, to your point, Tony, we, um, I, I got so much inspiration from our team, our t- our, uh, my co-founders. We saw it, we believed in it. And, and I think a lot of the entrepreneurs you know, listening to this today will know that if you have moments of weakness, you need people around you that see the vision or are optimistic and can, you know, lead for a, a couple of days or a couple of weeks it, as you are, are questioning. And I certainly had massive inspiration in my co-founders. And then the other thing was the early, um, the early folks who sampled, tasted the dog food, as we talk about it in technology, we would get them on a bike. My wife was one of them, but our friends would come in, put the headphones on and have them experience the Peloton bike, even in its earliest uh, phases. And they would get off dripping sweat and they'd say, wow, I, I want this. I love it. And so it was that um, uh, conviction from my co-founders and from the early uh, um, uh, customers who we saw that there was a there there, and we yeah. saw it clearly from day one. And and it was just unfortunate that the investors were were not seeing it through <laughs> for years and years. <laughs> well, I'm grateful you persisted because uh, I bought 14 of these things at Christmas. I was really touched. I'll bring it up in a moment about the letter you sent out because things didn't get delivered by Christmas. And I always say to everybody I train, it's what you do when you fail that matters most, not when you succeed, right? And I, I, I thought the elegant, the letter you sent out saying you're going to spend 10 times more money to get it to everybody, $100 million investment was amazing. But let me come back just for a second here. So the company was started in 2012, if I remember correctly. So it's like nine That's years right. ago. <laughs> it's worth $32 billion. When it wasn't working, and you still had the vision, how did you change your approach to get through to the investors? Or was it just pure mass, getting to enough people till you found the people that shared your vision? Yeah, I, uh, I, I think I kept the same approach. I think it was just with each quarter or month or quarter that ticked by, there was more meat on the bone with, okay, we have a prototype now, we have a contract manufacturer now, we have customers now, we have a store now, and eventually there was enough traction that we just willed into existence um, that, uh, you know, slowly but surely, um, investors got on board after they saw the results. The, the frustrating thing, Tony, is a, as a subscription business, we would have a bunch of sales and we'd go to the investors who, you know, were waiting to see the sales and make sure that there was a total addressable market and people, you know, that there was a product market fit as it's called. And I would say, okay, great. We've got these sales. And they say, oh, well, come back in two years because you have a subscription business. We need to make sure they don't churn off. Oh. And I'm like, come on. You're like, two years. I, can't, I don't have enough money to make it for two years. That's you know, right. it was such a frustrating reality. Wow. So you're, you just pushed forward. You kept improving. Give us a sense. I mean, it's unbelievable you've done this in nine years. So can you walk us through? The, it took you four years to get the funding. Is that correct? Uh, well... It took us, yeah, we did, I think, eight or nine rounds of financing. And so even up, up to last year when we did yeah. our IPO, that was a fundraising event. So we've kind of always been raising money. But it's interesting, like, Tony, as, as you were t- talking to uh, your community um, half hour ago about the goal of growing your business 100%, yeah. <clears throat> that's, that's been our goal as well. We've grown 100% every year since we launched the company. But it is something we care about. We, growth is in our DNA, and, and we want to, in the same way a lot, and Tony, it is great to finally connect with you, in, this, in the way that you're trying to to make people's lives better. Yes. Um, we, we see that as our, as our mission as well. And so it's not about the financial returns as much as we know that having a Peloton bike or tread in your house makes fitness easier and more fun and more entertaining and more accessible and more better value. And so if we have, you know, close to 2 million subscribers today, we want to have a hundred million sub- subscribers tomorrow because that's more people's lives we're going to impact, of course. I, I love your drive. Um, two things about that. I read somewhere, I don't know if this is true, you said you want to have 
two, you want to have 100 million subscribers, aren't there 200 million people that go to health clubs? So you're just going to expand the market, basically, or you're going to steal half the health club's people. Which one is it going to be, or both? I think, I think unfortunately, it's going to be the latter, just because our, the model's better. Home is better than traveling, in the same way that Netflix, yes. you know, every once in a while you'll go to the movie theater, but nine, 9 out of 10, 19 out of 20 movies are consumed on a device in your home now because it's more convenient. Yeah. And there's better selection. You know, when I was growing up in the 80s in the Keys, you'd go on Friday afternoon or Friday evening to the, the movie theater to meet your friends, mostly. But uh, there were two movies playing at the theater, and, and at eight o'clock, you got to choose one of those two. Yeah. So it's not just a better convenient from a loca- convenience from a location perspective; it's a selection. You can wake up tomorrow morning at and and, and time shifted. So at six twenty-two, Tony, your class would start, and it's going to be a thirty-minute '80s hip hop ride because that's what you want. That's how much time you have. That's what music you like. You can pick your instructor. So it's not just better location and time shifted. The class starts when you want it, but the class is exactly what you want. So in that world, it's so much better than the, than the old gym model. So I, I, I think that there's going to be downward pressure on, on the gym category over time, which is just an unfortunate reality of how much people like the Peloton experiences. It's interesting. We were talking about Blockbuster the other day because, as I'm sure you remember, they were doing, what, $3.2 billion and they had the chance to buy Netflix for fifty what was it $50,000 in the very beginning, like their third year in. I mean, I, not 50,000, 50 million, what am I saying? But the number for them would be like 50,000, right? So small. And sure. I remember seeing the chairman of 7-Eleven when they brought him in as the CEO three years before they went bankrupt saying, what's everybody talking about Netflix for? We can do the same thing better. But, you know, he was from 7-Eleven, right? He was from a location you went to. And, you know, we all have those blockages in our brain. We don't even realize they're there. You know, they're unconscious in our nature. And, you know, now they're gone. For sure. Tell me, you have a, you know, I have a, a core belief uh, I think that you and I share, which is I always tell people don't let, you know, perfect, because perfect is the lowest standard as far as I'm concerned because it never happens, but don't let perfect get in, get in the way of great. And I think you have perfect in the way of good. Uh, tell me how that's informed the way you've made decisions along the way where you could have got stopped if you're trying to be perfect, but you kept innovating or you kept, you know, iterating to get where you want to go. How important is that for your business and what do you think that is for other entrepreneurs? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I'm glad you brought it up, Tony. It's massively important for our culture. Uh, don't let perfect be, be the enemy of good. Yeah. Um, there's another s- phrase in, in uh, technology um, product development called MVP, which is, as you know, minimum viable product. Yeah. So while you can, you can picture this product that has all these bells and whistles and all these features, what are you going to launch 90 days from now? It's not going to have all that stuff. You've got to distill it to something that you can get out the door and hold your head high up, and then you start to iterate from there. And with the, especially with the software company where you can push over the air updates. So if you buy a buy Peloton bike or Peloton tread every month, the software and the content gets better. So I, you know, I, I used to sell uh, Peloton bikes in the, in the store and mostly in short Hills, New Jersey, I would say, get the bike. Trust me, the content's going to be better next year. The software's going to be better next year. And we've delivered on that every you know, couple months. We uh, launch incredible new feature sets. But uh, that's kind of just the mentality of, um, you know, don't, don't let perfect get in the way of getting stuff out and evolving your business and iterating and making sure that next week you're better than this week. Well, you know, you built such a thriving community, and there have been communities that people go to, you know, spin classes, a variety of companies without mentioning any in particular. You know them all. What do you think has made your community so strong? What have you done? Uh, obviously, the experience itself is useful, but what do you think has built your community to be so large and ever-expanding? Well, uh, it's a good question, Tony. When we were creating the concept of the Peloton bike, that we knew that two things were true. You went to a spin cl- an indoor cycling class because the content and it was the the instructor and the music and the lights and the entertainment and the motivation and all the stuff that the <clears throat> the instructor created uh, on stage and that was kind of the content broadly defined. There was also a second vector, though, that was just as important to your point, though, and it was the social aspects. It was seeing other people. Yes. It was the in, in the same way that in the in the dance and the energy that, that you had uh, 45 minutes ago, you saw the energy of other people and that gave you energy. And so there's, there's kind of a communal uh, motivation in group fitness. And when the whole class stands up, you stand up because it's not, it's not social pressure. You don't want to be the, the schmuck sitting down, right? So that, that the community and the motivation and the support and the, in some ways, competition, but, but mostly support and, and um, 
engagement and interactivity with the other people, we knew that that was an important vector. So it wasn't just streaming the content. Yes. We wanted to give, build social software, gamified software, so that you saw the other people, you see them on the leaderboard, you see how they're, you high five with them, you can video chat with them. But so we, we used to call it social software when we were building the product and it has evolved into a very powerful community that kind of took off on its own. You know, we, we kind of created a few tools, but it's, it's taken a whole new life and a whole new vector um, that we hadn't truly anticipated, to be honest, Tony. You know, one of the things we teach here is for everybody is, is satisfied customers go away, raving fans stay. You have a different way of languaging that I read someplace. What's your philosophy on really building that community and having those raving fans? What's your view about that? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, there's a term in, in, in our business and a lot of business called net promoter score that you yeah. know, and it's just how willing your your, your members, your customers are to, to um, recommend your business to a friend. It's very simple. It's, would you, it's one question. Would you recommend this product or this service to your friends? And it's a scale of negative 100 to 100. So it's a pretty big, broad scale. And you'll see credit cards or companies or, or insurance companies are often like negative 20 or yeah. something. It's a... Yeah. Um, but for Peloton, we're generally in the low 90s, which wow. means our, our, the people that discover Peloton and become members and get our, in our community, they are very happy and they're willing to tell their friends about it. And uh, it's beautiful. It's, a, it's an important part of the efficiency of our marketing. Um, and we take it seriously. We track it across all different parts of our business. And it's mostly, like, like you know, Tony, just a commitment to satisfying your members, making sure they have a great value. The value that they get today um, is going to be better tomorrow. So you're continuing to reinvest and making them happier and making their making them more satisfied. I, I, I hearken it to um, uh, Jeff Bezos with Amazon Prime, yeah. you know, that was launched probably 20 years ago. Every year, you got new stuff with Prime for the same membership, yeah. and so people just people just never left. And and you know, so many households in in America and now the world have Prime memberships, yeah. and we're trying to make the Peloton membership that same indispensable fitness subscription. Well, that's the, the core teaching here as well, is that the only way you become successful is add more value than anyone else in the marketplace. And, but it's adding the value the customer wants, not the customer you want to give, because a lot of entrepreneurs, they build a product for themselves. But it sounds like, I don't know if it's true, it's like, I heard, are you on the top of the leaderboard? Do you use this product yourself? Like, are, is that, did I hear that accurately, or are you a... Well, I, I, was, I was watching some stuff uh, about you prior this morning, and uh, I was thinking that you're much more of an athlete than I am, and I run a <laughs> fitness company, so I should be asking you that, <laughs> Tony. Um, I, I used to be a, a pretty competitive uh, runner and, and, and cyclist, but um, I'm turning 50 uh, next month. And, uh, my, my hardcore days are, are truly behind me. And <laughs> there's so many real, real cyclists on the Peloton leaderboard now that I'm, I'm not even close to the top. I'll be lucky if I'm in the top court. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I love that you took something that was a passion for you and, and turned on so many people. I'm curious, you know, uh, COVID for me was pretty tough. They made my job, you know, literally illegal around the world overnight. I was about to do an event for, you know, I do stadiums, usually 12,000, 15,000 people for four days and nights or a week. And then all of a sudden, people call me up saying, you're going to cancel. And the next thing I knew, I had no choice. I was being canceled literally all over the earth, Australia, London, everywhere. And, uh, and my first thing was, okay, well, screw it. I'll do this in movie theaters. I only say 10 people. We'll do 1,200 movie theaters with 10. And then they shut down the movie theaters. I'll do this in churches. They're not going to leave Costco open and then shut churches. And they shut the churches down. But I never envisioned, I'll be honest with you. I said I'd never do this in people's homes because they don't have the music. They don't have the group dynamic. You don't have a crowd of 15,000 people. But as we're discovering here, we found a way to do this that's even better for many people. I still love live events. But, you know, we had 836,000 people do a six-day program with me a month ago. It was just like I would normally go to, like, 2019 would be a typical year. I went to 118 cities and 16 countries. That was my life, right? And I'd see a quarter of a million people. So I saw more in a week. So wow. my question to you is, it's like a new world to be able to do this. At what point? Did you know this technology? Did you already know it would be this size because you had been working in, in digitization you know, and saw what the market was? Are you doing more? I mean, I, I read that, I think it was March, you guys trained a million people in a day. I was feeling good about myself that I read, but you guys, well, when did you know that it was gonna explode at this level? I'm curious. Well, Tony, you are exactly why uh, I believed in Peloton because I, uh, 
if you if you want to take one of these courses that you provide, you want the best. You don't want the the poor man's Tony Robbins. Right. You want Tony Robbins, right? Yeah. And um, in the same way, in New York City, we would see the top instructors at the top times at the top studios would be so oversubscribed in New York City within. 20 seconds, they would sell out. Those, those 50 bucks were gone. Wow. But I would say about maybe 5,000 people would have been, wanted to be in that class. And it's because the, 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 the instructor matters, the human matters. It's, it's the reason why Tom Cruise makes, you know, hundred million dollars a year or whatever. And, yeah. and there's a lot of starving, starving actors in LA because people want the best. And, uh, and so when we, when we started the, pel- the platform, we said, God, if we can, if we can allow 10 million people to take the best class at the best time from around the world. And Tony, because of the, um, the production value, the content and the cameras, and as you're seeing, you can do more with, with different production value, the content that you couldn't have done in the stadium yeah. that you can do. And True. there's with, with camera tricks and camera angles and lighting, and, yeah. um, you can do more and create different energy. Um, that, uh, that was very clear to me that instead of teaching 50 people in a sweaty basement yeah. as, as the, uh, traditional, um, indoor cycling or, or group fitness model, um, had evolved to, if you can scale it via digital media, um, you know, you could have millions of people in the same class <clears throat> and that, and the, the energy that the instructor will get as, as you're seeing, you know, I'm sure it was very energizing for you to have eight, eight, a hundred thousand people. Yeah. And cause you know, you're better when people are giving it back to you. Yeah. And so we said the same thing with our instructors. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted live studios. So we've invested $50 million in a studio in New York city and $50 million in a studio in London. So that when the, inter- when the instructor is coaching, there is 50 or 60 people local yes. so that they're getting the energy from that, from the people um, in the studio. Yes. And then you, you know, you in Fiji or you in Palm beach and me in, in the West village, yes. we're feeling that energy at home. Yes. We're actually doing that here too. We have these 50 foot high or 20 foot high LED walls, but I, I had a 40 foot high ceiling here. And so this wall lifts and then I can put 1200 people in their lives who are some similar thinking. So you can have that and still have, 10 or 50 or whatever number of thousands of people around the world. Tell me, um, how did you gear up? You know, when you ever have a problem, you know, some people try to ignore it. Some people try to blame something. Uh, most intelligent people find a solution, but a solution's cognitive. A solution's not real till you make a change. And the minute you make a change, it creates a new problem, hopefully a better quality problem, right? When you're growing as fast as you are, how the hell did you gear up for the growth you've experienced in the last two years? What did you do? And then when it didn't work, because there's some things outside your control, obviously, like COVID, you know, how have you adapted? Share with us if you would, because everyone has to deal with these issues if they're successful. You know, people think if they're successful, there's no more problems, but you and I both know that's bullshit. You just have a better quality of problem, but it's still a problem if you don't fulfill your customers' needs. That's right. So we, we have a saying, uh, don't use hope as a method. So we are operators. We act uh, owners in, in your vernacular. Yes. We act like owners and we, um, w- you know, we build stuff and we love solving problems. Yes. Um, we, uh, uh, yeah, we, 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 we love the operating side. The operating side of Peloton has never been the problem. Um, we also have, uh, lofty ambitions and we plan for success. I, I often say, don't plan for six, su- don't plan for failure, plan for success because they become self-fulfilling. So one of the ways we were able to keep up with a lot of the crazy COVID demand was we, we were expecting to grow like this and next year we expect to grow like this. And so we're investing in supply chain. You know, when I say we're going to go from 2 million subscribers to a hundred million subscribers, we have a watertight plan of doing that. We're not, I'm just not espousing hot air to, you know, try <laughs> to try and create lofty goals for our team. We, we, we see it, we have a plan to do it. We're investing in, in that. And so it's again, not using hope as a method and, and, and planning for success. That's beautiful. And, and, and that type of goal has <laughs> got to excite people. I always tell people goals affect you whatever they are. And some people think they have any goals, their goals to get through the day, but Goals like that <laughs> would certainly keep your team moving, brother. That's pretty exciting. Tell me, if you would, you're also, you know, one of the things I respect about you is like, we're, you know, even in this culture, everywhere we go, we look at the planet's our playground and love is our legacy, right? So we're looking to give back, not as a positioning mode or virtual signaling, but just because it's what fulfills human beings and it gives you more drive. And I saw that you've partnered, I think, with Beyonce, and you're going to be delivering, I guess, these for... 10 black colleges, would you tell us something about what you're doing in that area? And would you tell us why you think it's important for companies to have some sense of mission besides their product or service and giving back to a community of sorts or maybe many communities? 
Yeah, that uh, that partnership with Beyonce is to give um, uh, twenty thousand free digital memberships to HBC, uh, students of HBCUs, um, and that's just one part of. Uh, of the Peloton pledge, which was a hundred million dollar pledge to fight uh, social injustice in the states, coming out of the Black Lives Matter movement, and we were very excited, and our team got excited, and our members got excited, and to give a hundred million dollars across the next four years was was a big swing. But our board was very supportive, and our team was uh, super energized. But you're right, Tony. I uh, I love this new world order where businesses are are not only um, able to but expected to yeah. be a bigger part of the fabric of the communities and and you and you'll know um, a couple of years ago uh, Jamie Diamond as part of the business roundtable formally said that uh, it used to be you know coming out of Milton Friedman 30 years ago that uh, as CEOs and leadership teams were 100% focused or, or should be 100% focused on their shareholders and a couple of years ago the business Roundtable said, no, that's not true. We're, we're readjusting the Correct. expectation of businesses and leaders to include employees, to include members, to include communities. Um, and uh, and I, I love it. We, 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 we want to be an important part of the fabric, an important part of move, the movement forward. In some ways where governments have failed us across the globe, uh, businesses can step in. And to the extent that some of the investors are wanting us to do that, I get great feedback from some of the big institutional investors now that we're now the Republic, where they say, we watch what you're doing. We're seeing how you're acting on the social justice front, um, environmental front, all, all of these different uh, new vectors that you're being judged by. And uh, it's fun. And, and I love that people are noticing. And I do care as a human being. Again, my dad uh, served uh, the country in, in Vietnam and went to the Naval Academy. And I, I have this great patriotic gene. And so it's fun that um, businesses are allowed to do it now. And, uh, and we're definitely not going to default on our responsibility. It's something I really, again, want to encourage everyone listening, because it, as I've shared with you before, all of you here, you know, whatever your motivation, it affects you and you can't fake it. If you're just motivated for yourself, there's nothing wrong with that. You're part of life. Life gives you insights. If you're trying to make life better, if you're trying to take care of your family, my experience is you get more insights, you know, because you're supporting more of life, not just yourself. Trying to support a community, it gets higher. Trying to support humanity. I'm not talking about virtual signaling. I'm not saying what you say. You know what's driving you. But if you'll do that early on, you know, Mark Benioff is a good friend of mine, John, and he's, he came to like nine of my seminars in a row when he was still working at Oracle. And he's a big guy who's standing in the front row. And at one point he came up and met me, introduced himself, and uh, I said, I've seen you here a lot of times. I said, you know, are you, uh, are you slow? And kind of teased him. He said, no, you talk about repetitions and other skill. But that day he told me, he said, I'm leaving Oracle because of you, and I'm going to start this company called Salesforce.com. And he said, Tony, I just got to tell you, we're going we're gonna to change business around the world. And he looked at me in the face, and he says, we're going to do $100 million in business of course this year. You're going to do $20 billion this year in business, right, with Mark. So I've been on that journey. But one of the great things Mark did was, in the very beginning, we were talking about contribution, and Mark took it to heart. And he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm gonna, while we're small, I'm gonna do things I probably won't do when I'm big. I'm gonna give 1% of the revenues, I'm gonna give 1% of our stock, and 1% of our people's time. And now Google has copied that, you know, Jamie Dimon and some others have picked onto those pieces. Mark's been a real leader in that area. But what I see in Mark is not only the impact, but the joy that it gives him, I know that it gives you, that it gives me, and I hope all of you will take that to heart, because you'll do more for others you care about than you will for yourself. That's the nature of being a human being. That's a, the best part of us. Tell me if you would, What's, what's the, what is it that fulfills you most at this stage of your life, and how are your days filled? I'm curious at this stage. I mean, you've got how many employees now? I think we have uh, close to 8,000 employees globally. Um, and yes, uh, Mark has been an inspiration to me, Mark Benioff uh, as well, to be honest, Tony. Um, he, 15 years ago, I believe, published how uh, Salesforce was doing on a women in tech, yes. uh, black, pro black professionals yeah. across uh, engineering roles, and just really uh, opened uh, the, the, um, the statistics of his company, even when they weren't perfect, even when they weren't good. He said, wow, I, I want to expose this and challenge other business leaders to expose it so we can at least talk about uh, the problems and the opportunities. And so um, it's uh, he's been a, um, a real champion of social change and uh, and team culture, which I which I um, have been taking notes. He's uh, obviously a visionary on that front, as you well know. Um, but what uh, what I. I, like Mark, um, although be it probably a lot less successfully, uh, care deeply about our culture. Um, and, and I would say I'm the chief culture officer because in order to recruit and retain the best people in the world and at, at all these fancy jobs, and if you want the best people, 
Um, you've got to have an incredible culture um, internally. And um, interestingly, in today's world order, the internal culture also permeates into the consumer brand. As you've seen, some, some businesses uh, misstep with social media and with, um, with everyone having a voice with Twitter. Uh, you, you have to make sure that your team is incredible and your culture is incredible. Um, and then think about your consumer brand. So it's, uh, I, I'm a student of all this stuff. And um, uh, as we get bigger, it's gets harder, especially to your point, Tony, with not your inability to travel. And I think you and I are the same type of people where we get energy from other people yeah. and we want to be in person. And so it's been, uh, I think you and I have been kind of one arm behind, behind our back is with our, with our leadership style that we adopted for decades. And yeah. so, um, it's been a little challenging, but I'm definitely looking forward to this fall, getting back in an airplane and, uh, and seeing, seeing these people and visiting our sites. Me too. Eric Yon is a good friend of mine who started Zoom, and you know he made this possible because they used to only have a thousand people max you could get on. So he made all these adjustments to help us make this happen. But he even said to me the other day, he said, "I am zoomed out <laughs> from Eric Yon, who made twenty billion dollars doing Zoom." Right? Let's go for some Q and A here from the audience, ladies and gentlemen. John's been really wonderful with us. Who's got some questions? Raise your hand. We'll come to you right now. Karina. <laughs> Karina, where are you in the world? I'm in beautiful San Francisco Bay Area in Wine San Country, Francisco, Sonoma. ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> What's your question for John? Well, um, it was re it's really about COVID and how it's destroyed my business. I'm an event planner and wedding planner, so I'm waiting, Tony, like you. <laughs> um, but this whole move to virtual has been amazing, and I just... I'm wondering how much your margins have increased with uh, COVID and if it was kind of this blessing or would you, would Peloton have been this big um, without it? Yeah, I, I totally believe that Peloton is going to be one of the great consumer brands of the next couple of decades. Um, and I, I, it's undeniable that COVID was uh, was tailwind for us. I mean, I, I don't want to be cavalier. It um, people stuck at home and gyms closed. Uh, there's no question. It is it has helped demand, but uh, uh, it, it to me has been an inevitability that fitness is going to move into the home. People would rather work out at the ho at home. It's just been uh, such a dopey category, and and it was all about hardware. Going and getting on a stationary bike in your basement and staring at a wall and listening to your old 80s mix on your headphones is just not awesome. So what we did was we took that stationary bike and brought in a community of people and all the software and all the content and the best instructors and the best music and the best programming and selection and your friends and you know social stuff and we've we've made it awesome. So um, as uh, and same thing with our tread, bringing in uh, boot camp classes uh, into your home with the best instructors and best music on and off the tread. So uh, to, to your question about margin, um, Tony brought up the idea or the, the reality that we had to airship spending a hundred million dollars bringing in treads and bikes from Asia so that we can uh, satisfy the demand. So obviously with commitments like that to our brand and to our members, um, that they would otherwise have hurt margin. Um, uh, but luckily the cost of acquisition went down. So some of the things went up, some of the things went down. So the margin structure has increased, but we've, uh, we've done some things that are pro-consumer that have taken, taken us backwards a little bit. That's great. Thank you. Well, I love that you're all about fun because I am too. So. <laughs> we can see that, Karina. <laughs> Give her a hand. How about there on room eight? Room eight. Um, Michelle, I'm the first, per the person of the first on the first day. <laughs> well, Michelle, tell us where are you in the world? We are in Belgium. Belgium, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Belgium. What's your business well, and what's your question for John? Well, we do organic superfoods uh, in the Amazon rainforest, and uh, we provide them in the easiest way possible to final consumers around the world. Very nice. uh, and then uh, I would just like to say, Tony, you have really changed my life, so I'm very grateful to be here and uh, super inspired by you, really. Thank you. I thank listen you. every day thank to, you. to many of your videos, and I, I read the book, so thank you. Well, thank you. You did everything. it. I won't take the credit, but I'm grateful I could help. What's your question for John? So, John, um, we are a growing company, but still um, a small company, so we our bottleneck now is actually employees. So we just have a few, 
and we would like to have the best team, but we don't know how to do that. Of course, our budget is limited. And uh, I would like to know how was this experience for you to build a team with the people that you wanted, uh, establishing a culture and still having a budget. So how to pass through this um, yeah, bottleneck that we are now? <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, it's a great question. I, I, I will say, and this is going to be a, a not controversial, but uh, something coming out of COVID that a lot of people will debate, but I think spaces matter a ton. Uh, so I have always wanted to capitalize the Peloton, Peloton business so that we could invest in physical spaces, namely a headquarters that is awesome to come to work physically. So as you think about recruiting people, if you have a gorgeous office where it's open and fun and you play music and there's snacks and there's coffee and there's energy, the same energy that uh, uh, Tony had an hour ago, if you have a place to come, obviously you wouldn't be dancing around all day, but, but <laughs> energy matters. And, uh, and to me, spending the you know $10,000 a month or $20,000 a month, whatever space, uh, um, however big you need and, and what the cost of space is in Belgium, but I think when you recruit people and you interview them in an office where they can see themselves, I, I've always cared about that. And so from day one, we invested in physical spaces where we can bring everyone together and then you, energy begets energy and you can recruit more people. But just as one small tactic, obviously you need to pay, pay right and you need to market and, and get the um, I get the word out on your on your open job recs, but uh, physical space to me has always mattered, and it's a little bit um, self selecting. People that like coming to the office and like that energy, and were turned on by your space and your vibe, then they'll join, and and it will it will energy begets energy. Very nice. Give her a hand. Thank you so much. How about Brett Scott there, room seventeen? Brett Scott, let's bring him up. Brett, where are you in the world? Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, Georgia. A place John knows well. <laughs> what's your question? What business are you in, Brett? And what's your question oh, for John? I'm, I'm a real estate agent and a life coach. I help people get from where they are to where they really want to be. Very nice. So my question for you is more about the heart, man. After seeing something that you believed in so much finally succeed, can you describe in detail what that felt like? I would love to hear that from you. Or what it feels like still. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, uh, funny, funny you ask. Our stock is down 10% today. Uh, and I don't, I don't care about our stock. Uh, but there's still so many non believers in Peloton. Um, so many people think that it's going to be a COVID story and that, you know, in six months, our, our sales are going to go, you know, plummet because uh, everyone who wanted a bike or a tread bought it in COVID and, and everyone's going to rush back to the gym and Peloton is screwed. Um, so I, I, to answer your question, we feel so, uh, back to Tony's words, hungry and humble that, you know, we're at, we're 2% into the hundred million subscriber goal. So we're not, we're, we're absolutely not doing a victory dance or patting ourselves on the back. We're still, you know, a little pissed off, a lot of fire in our belly, yeah. um, a lot of non-believers and uh, still really trying to show that this is the future of fitness and this isn't, you know, um, going the way of, you know, maybe a GoPro or a Fitbit, uh, that, that had, collapsed and, and these, these investors, you know, study the, the parallels. And so we're still trying to show that we are a special company. And so we're, um, you know, I appreciate you asking about the heart and we, and we definitely have a lot of heart at, at Peloton, but, uh, we're not, uh, we're not content or, or celebrating just yet. Keeping their hunger. That's beautiful. That's a real entrepreneur. Never satisfied. That's man. right. Give me a hand. Thank you, Brett. One more. How about Ann Ferris over there? Room, let's 15, room 15. Tell me, where are you in the world? What's your business? I live in Costa Rica and- Costa I'm Rica, a, ladies and gentlemen. I'm from Chicago. I just couldn't take that cold weather anymore. <laughs> and what's your business? I have an e-commerce brand. I'm about to launch a new one. I support um, new mothers and how they bond with their babies and help them feel beautiful. Beautiful. What's your question yeah. for John? My question- was, you know, when you were starting out that Peloton, there's so much, there's so much logistics in starting that company because you have the bikes and you have the software and you have the instructors. So there's so many parts that have to all come together right at the beginning. And I'm kind of feel that way in scaling my business as well, that I have so many parts to come together 
but I don't have the funding to hire people for all of those parts. So I was curious if you could share a little bit of what was your journey kind of in the trenches when you were really trying to get all the pieces together to be able to launch? Yeah, I think it's a great question. and certainly was top of mind as we were building Peloton is, is pick your spots. And, and to Tony's point, not letting perfect be the enemy, be the enemy of good. Uh, we partnered in, in the early days with some things that we now own. Um, we bought some manufacturers in Taiwan. We now do logistics and deliveries, which we didn't do originally. But what we said was we need to be awesome with the software and the content and the hardware. Those three things were critical. We eventually got good at retail. We eventually got good at logistics. We eventually got good at manufacturing. But it was uh, another another fun thing, Tony, you'll appreciate that we said a lot in the early days is you got to rob a few gas stations on the way to the perfect crime. <laughs> and uh, we, we, we robbed a lot of gas stations, meaning... We did things that weren't that weren't perfect that you wouldn't be proud of, yeah. but you just get through. <laughs> but you got to focus on what what's going to make your business special and what's going to resonate with the consumers, and outsource and try and lean on third parties that can help you um, get to you know the perfect place. I think it's such a beautiful answer, John, because I think everybody here needs to remember you can't do it all. If you try to do it all in the beginning, you're going to fail. You have to figure out what is the core competency? What does the client really love most? What do they care about? And over-deliver that. And as John described, the rest you're going to try and outsource, connect. And eventually, as you grow and get better, you'll either own them or you'll certainly have a better set of choices. Great answer. Thank you for that, John. John, you've been really generous with your time. I want to thank you. I just, well, last question I have for you is I'd love to know if you had three pieces of advice to give any entrepreneur on the journey you've been on, because you've been heads of CEOs of large companies, you've built this extraordinary brand, and, and I love that you're 2% of where you want to be, and I love your mindset. But if you were going to give the two or three most pieces, important pieces of information or advice you've ever heard or you'd want to give somebody, what would they be? The most important one, for sure, is finding uh, partners that are high integrity, that share your work ethic, that you like being around, that inspire you, that are good culture fits for you and, and the way you work. Because a lot of times I'll see other entrepreneurs and I'll ask them who their team is and they've cobbled together some people. But it's not it's not going to work because it's not the right people. Yeah. So if there's people in your company that are either dragging you down or don't feel like they fit, you got to solve that because it's not going to you're not going to be great with uh, with people that don't fit well with you. Um, obviously, uh, if, if if you can get the, also the right capital partners, I've I've through the years uh, misstepped and then had capital partners that didn't share my vision or didn't philosophically align with me or or had a different investment horizon. They were good people, but they, you know, were thinking three years out, not, not 30 years out. And so, um, to me, it's, it's all about the people. And, um, and then to your point, Tony, setting your vision high, not being your own ceiling, really defining your opportunity big. Um, while you might, uh, you might not see getting there tomorrow, but at least you, you know, know where you're going to be 15 years from now and then set your, you know, your next three year plan, um, in that direction so that if you succeed, you're, you're getting where you want to go. That's beautiful. John, thank you. You've been so generous. You have a beautiful heart and you have a beautiful mind and you've got a beautiful company. You've got a lot of fans all around the world right now and I know it's only going to grow. Thank you for your time, brother. Hope to see you again soon. 